Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me Dr. Nitin Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a spine surgeon who is the chief of spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Bhatia did his undergraduate training at Stanford. He then went on to Baylor College of Medicine where he completed his MD degree. From there, he did orthopedic surgery training at UCLA. From there, he finished a, a spine fellowship at the University of Miami. Today, he practices complex spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Good day, Dr. Bhatia. Thank you for having me. Dr. Bhatia, what, what I would like to discuss over the next 20 minutes or so is the concept of herniated disc in the lumbar spine, or what some people refer to as the low back. Um, I think everybody's heard of this concept of a ruptured disc or a herniated disc. Um, explain that to us. What is it? Really? Sure. Uh, I think it's a, gr it's a great question. Unfortunately, it's a problem that happens very commonly. The discs are the shock absorbers of the spine, and their structure is, uh, has two components to it. They have a firm outside and a jelly-like inside, almost like a jelly donut. Now the key for their function is that the jelly stays inside and allows motion uh, both forward, backward, sideways, and some rotation. And it allows the disc to absorb any shock that we feel. That's why we can run and jump and do all the things we do. Unfortunately, if, ab for, if abnormal pressure is put on that disc, some of the jelly or nucleus can herniate out. And it becomes a problem when it herniates and starts pushing on the nerves that sit adjacent to the disc immediately behind it. Now, what sort of symptoms does that cause? I mean, uh, if there's pressure on those nerves, what do I as a patient experience? The classic uh, term for it is sciatica. So you get the shooting pain down the leg, usually down the side or the back of the leg. It can also be associated with uh, significant back pain that usually subsides within a few days. But the overall uh, sensation is that shooting pain down the back or side of the leg, sometimes down the front as well, uh, including numbness, tingling, or even weakness in the leg. And it, it, my understanding is that it depends on what nerves involved as to where the pain goes. So different people with sciatica have different pain in different areas. But it, it means a different disc is involved. Exactly. And what we know is that specific nerves innervate different parts of the leg. For example, the front of the thigh is innervated by uh, lumbar three or lumbar four. And so if the, if, the ner if the disc in that area herniates, that's where you get your pain and numbness in the front of the thigh. But if it, the lumbar five sacrum one disc herniates, which is the very bottom level, that's more the side or the back of the leg. So you get the numbness, pain, tingling down the back of the leg. So you, we can actually get a pretty good idea of which disc is herniated based on the patient's symptoms. You know, I think one thing that's always hard for patients to understand is that a lot of these patients with sciatica, especially the young patients who have a classic herniated disc, don't have any back pain. Right. So they, when you tell them the problem is in their back, they look at you like, what are you talking about? I've got pain in my foot. I've got pain in my ankle. Exactly. And, and patients also come to me and say, but I didn't do anything. I had a very relaxing weekend. I kind of sat on the couch and watched basketball all weekend. Mm -hmm. I didn't lift a suitcase, I didn't uh, go weightlifting, and frequently there's no inciting incident, there's no trauma, nothing, no lifting activity, and the, the herniation just happens for kind of an unknown cause. Well, that, that's a good point. I think that all of us tend to think about things that happen to our bodies, especially you know, bones and joints, mm -hmm. as an injury of some sort. And not everything that happens to us is necessarily an injury. Right. Um, there's another, I think, controversy, or maybe it's not so controversial anymore, but it's the concept of what's causing the sciatica. It's the concept of whether it's the pressure on the nerve or whether it's the chemical now from the leaking disc. What's your position on that? Well, I definitely think it's from the pressure on the nerve. And the reason I think that is, is we see a lot of people with small disc herniations. They may get an MRI scan for another reason, and they've got these tiny little disc herniations, but the nerves aren't hurting. Now, they might be having some pain in the back, in the low back itself, but the sciatica is not there. Um, and those little disc herniations are probably leaking almost as much chemical as a bigger one. But the difference is the bigger ones, or the ones that happen to be in just the right spot where they catch the nerve, cause the shooting pain. Mm -hmm. And we also know that once you take the pressure off of that nerve um, and take the piece of disc that's herniated out, the pain goes away. 
Well, let's go back to the symptoms and, and, and what I as a patient am going to feel. Um, we've talked about pain, which is, is obviously one of the things that the patients come in with. So, sometimes we see patients that just come in and say, my foot's not working right. right. You know, the muscle's not working. I don't have a lot of pain, or they may have numbness. What is the spectrum of things that you look for as a spine surgeon to try and determine whether this patient has a herniated disc or not? What's the most reliable symptom? The most reliable symptoms is one of those things that you mentioned. Numbness, sometimes tingling, definitely pain in a particular nerve pattern. So I want to see it in just one of those nerves that I mentioned before. Is it in the front where the L3 or L4 is? Is it down the back? Is it down the side? If it's the whole leg, then I'm a little concerned that it may not be a nerve, but there may be something else going on instead of a particular nerve pattern. Um, the weakness also should fit a particular nerve pattern to really give us an idea that that nerve itself is being uh, injured and is now inflamed and not working correctly. Now, when, when patients are referred to you because they're either their primary care physician thinks they have a herniated disc, or the patient themselves makes an appointment and thinks they have a herniated disc, how do you proceed? What do you want to know from that person? And describe how you try to make a diagnosis. You know, the history is extremely important. I think we've talked about that, how really figuring out where the pain and where the other symptoms are is, is very important to give us a good mental picture of what the problem it probably is. We then do a physical exam, and the things we're really looking for are, are the nerves irritated? And we can tell that by stretching the nerves and seeing if it causes more pain. We can also check the strength. So if someone's having weakness in their legs or having difficulty walking on their tiptoes, it can show us that the nerves aren't working correctly and hence they're getting weakness uh, in a particular area. And then finally we can get x-rays, although they usually look fairly normal. Um, and then an MRI scan is usually the test of choice to confirm our diagnosis by looking at the nerves and looking at the discs and getting an idea of if the disc is herniated in the area that we thought it would be. And the MRI scan is, is in your hands, the, the gold standard in terms of making this diagnosis. That's good. One thing comes to, to mind, because, you know, I think a lot of things, call, as you mentioned, if you've got whole leg pain, a lot of things can cause pain in the leg and, and mimic a herniated disc. What is, the, what is the most common presentation in terms of the patient? I've always thought that a herniated disc is a young man's disease or a young woman's disease, whereas the older we get, that leg pain is more likely caused not by a herniated disc, but by something, bone spurs or something narrowing the area where the nerve goes out. Is, is that still considered correct information? It is. And a herniated disc is usually someone in their 30s or 40s, and it's usually kind of an isolated, sudden problem. As we get older, we all get some arthritis and bone spurs that cause some narrowing of the spinal canal. Unfortunately, in some people, that does cause some pinching of the nerves, but it's a much more gradual process, um, and it's, it's a very different origin than the herniated disc. Now, it can be challenging from a history and physical point of view to tell the difference, except usually the people with the herniated disc are younger and haven't had any symptoms before. Mm -hmm. Um, the people with the bone spurs may have had some degenerative arthritic problems. They're usually older, usually over the age of 60. Um, and the MRI scans will also look different. So it's the MRI scan where you really sort of decide. And, Correct. And whether it's a young person, old person, that's where you make the decision of if it's a true ruptured or herniated disc. Co correct. It really helps confirm the idea that we have. Any other tests that you would recommend getting? Um, after the MRI scan to usually, clarify it. Usually the MRI scans as much as we need. Occasionally we can get an EMG or nerve conduction test which shows us particularly which muscles or nerves are having trouble or a specialized CAT scan but those are usually only necessary in very complex problems or problems where the diagnosis is not clear. Okay. So if I'm a patient with a herniated disc and, and we've made the diagnosis, we have our uh, an MRI scan that shows a big herniated fragment or, or a, a disc that's out there pushing on the nerve, and I'm having pain, what are my treatment options? How do you proceed at that point? Well, the good news is 90% of these herniations will get better on their own within approximately three months. And so our goal for those three months is to just keep the patient comfortable while the body tries to resorb that herniation. Now, some of the 
caveats to that is if somebody comes in with real weakness in that leg, they're kind of dragging their foot, or they're so painful that they can't, you know, they can't get out of bed and can't walk around, probably we've got to move a little more quickly with them. But as long as the pain is tolerable um, and the weakness isn't too bad, we start with some anti-inflammatory medications, some physical therapy, and then perhaps some injected steroids, which we call epidural injections. Mm -hmm. And the goal, as you mentioned, none of these things are probably going to cure the problem. The body's going to cure the problem itself, and that's just a healing process. Correct. We're just covering up the symptoms or trying to reduce the symptoms so that the person can go and do their, their, their activities, work, and that sort of stuff more comfortably. That's exactly right. Is there any, any other time where you would rush to surgery for a herniated disc? In the rare case where the disc herniation is so big that the uh, patient is having problems going to the bathroom, either bowel or bladder, that's actually an emergency, which we call a cauda equina syndrome. And that truly is a surgical emergency. If, if that develops, say, at 9 a.m., that patient needs to be in the operating room that same day. Otherwise, those bowel and bladder problems can become permanent very quickly. Okay. Now, define for me this, this cauda equina syndrome. Um, it primarily means, that, I mean, the patients that, that have this, are they having trouble leaking urine? They can't go? Uh, are they incontinent of bowels or they're constipated? When we say bowel and bladder changes, what are we meaning? It, it can actually be kind of a um, uh, spectrum of those problems. Frequently they'll have retention because they can't open their bladders. Some patients uh, have problems actually closing their sphincters as well, so they have leakage. Mm -hmm. um, but probably most frequently we see significant retention uh, when they have significant injury like that. So their bladder fills up, they can't go. Exactly. And, and, and then they begin to leak because it's just over, right. overflowing. And I'm, I'm assuming that full bladder causes pain too. For sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, I think that, that those patients uh, sometimes have is numbness around, you know, in the crotch area, around right. the vagina, around the testicles and that sort of stuff, right. around the rectum. Right. And in fact, in those patients, an examination of that area is very important to check if the sensation has gone and to see if they're able to control their bowels and their rectum um, because they, what we'll find is that they lose significant control of that. Which levels, uh, is the cauda equina syndrome more worrisome at specific levels? I've heard different things and I'm not certain um, what to worry about the most. Probably the levels where it's most serious is the low thoracic and upper lumbar spine, what we call the thoracolumbar junction. Um, from approximately T10, T11, and T12, which are the three lowest areas of the thoracic spine, which is the chest area, and the upper one or two lumbar is lumbar one or two. Now, fortunately, that's not a common place to have disc herniations or other spine problems. So that area is usually fairly well saved. The places where we really see the cauda equina syndrome more frequently is in the mid or low lumbar spine. So lumbar three, four, and five, which are the bottom three levels. Okay. It is quite a rare problem, though, uh, fortunately. Okay. But, but you can still have a cauda equina syndrome with a massive disc herniation, even at L5-S1, L4-5. For sure. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about surgical options. Um, let's say that, that I've gone through, I've had an epidural steroid, I've tried the conservative therapy. You know, I've got a little weakness, but it's not too bad, and I'm not... I'm not too concerned about that, but I'm still having pain. Right. And I may have a little numbness and tingling. I'm three months out. I'm a patient and I'm, I'm getting a little frustrated now. What are my options? Well, at that point, you've done everything right. You know, you've tried the physical therapy, tried the injections, and, and the pain's still going on. What we know is that the longer the pressure's on the nerves, the more permanent the damage becomes. And probably, it's best to get the pressure off of the nerves either by letting the body do it within the first two or three months or by surgically taking the pressure off within three to six months from the onset of the symptoms. After that point, the, some of the problems become more permanent and probably outcomes are worsened. Mm -hmm. um, so really in that case, if, if the patient's done it, if you've done everything and the pain continues, we're looking at surgery. Now fortunately, surgery for this problem is very simple. We go in, we take out that little area of disc that's herniated and pushing on the nerves, we don't take out the whole disc, just the very herniated portion of jelly. Um, 
in a very small procedure, and usually the pain goes away almost immediately. Yeah, you know, in, in, up until several years ago, I think, there were some classic research studies that pretty much said the following. If you look, if you took 100 people with a herniated disc, and you followed those people, you split them in half, 50-50, and you follow those people for five years, at the end of five years, you couldn't tell the difference between the group that had surgery and didn't have surgery. Now, I think some of that has changed, and, and this notion about, well, that's true for those people um, at that three-month period. Do, do you think it's changing at this point to where we're more likely to, to look at folks who, who have a herniated disc and aren't getting better at that first three months, that they're better off having surgery at that point? rather than waiting that five, five years. For sure. And, and the reason is we, we recently had some great studies come out. Actually, government-funded, uh, multiple-center, prospective, randomized studies, which are the best kind of scientific studies we can do, where they took hundreds and hundreds of patients and said, okay, some of them with these disc conditions are going to not have surgery, and some of them are going to have surgery, and then saw how they did. And what they found was in the patient's who they allowed to choose. So some patients said, oh, I want to have surgery, and some patients said, no, no, I don't. And they followed those patients. The patients who chose to have surgery early and stayed with that decision got better much faster, and got to work much sooner, and got back to their normal life much faster than without surgery. And their outcomes were actually better two years down the road. Now, there was another group of patients that they, that they selected, for, the patients that I'll do whichever you tell me to, and they split them up in half. But then some of the patients, you know, after six weeks said, oh, no, I can't. I can't stand not having surgery, and they would go back and forth. But even in that group, the surgical patients got better faster, more reliably, and at two years, their results were trending to be better than the patients who didn't have surgery. So we're seeing probably better results with surgery a little earlier. And I think that is a definite change in the last decade in terms of, of what we as, as spine specialists and, and physicians thought mm -hmm. 10 years ago. I think the other thing is, is that uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, a discectomy was an incision right. this big. I mean, right. it was huge. Nowadays, we're doing them more and more minimally invasive. So right. I think that the impact of that surgery is less. Exactly. You know, it used to be a surgery, as you mentioned, four or five inch incision in the hospital, five days, takes uh, three months to recover. You know, nowadays, my incision, my average incision is approximately half an inch. It's about 12, 13 millimeters. Mm -hmm. Um, it's outpatient surgery. If surgery is at 7 a.m., you're home by 3, um, and essentially back to work and doing everything within a week or two. Um, it's really a whole different kind of surgery than it used to be uh, when we do it using some of the modern techniques that, that I have available. Well, let's talk a little bit about those techniques. I mean, how does, how does that half-inch incision and the operation that you do through that differ from the one I used to do with a <laughs> five-inch incision? Um, under direct vision? Well, fundamentally, the surgery is the exact same. And I'll tell you, no, I would never, ever recommend sacrificing the surgery in regards to getting the patient better for a size of an incision. Um, some people, they need a bigger incision, and so they get a bigger incision. But for this problem, what we found is with the new techniques, even through a tiny incision, we can get the same procedure done. And, and the procedure involves going in and, like I said, essentially scraping away that herniated jelly um, using a microscope now and some of our minimally invasive retractors, we're able to see just as much as we need to see, and almost even better because of the great vision we have with the microscope or endoscopes that we use um, and can perform it very safely. But fundamentally, once we're in there, whether it's an incision this big or this big, the surgeries are the same. Mm -hmm. We just are finding a different way to get it with less side effects. Yeah, yeah and I definitely think that you, you know, we've all, every surgeon, has, has understood that the less normal tissue you destroy or damage, the better off the patient's going to be. Exactly. So anything we can do to get in and get the job done with, with less destruction is better. Exactly. Less destruction, less scar, faster postoperative healing, less blood loss. There's a lot of reasons to do it as long as you get the job done. You mentioned sort of the recovery period, but what is the long-term results of, of a disc injury and then surgery for the disc, how long is it before I can sort of forget this happened to me? And then after that, what are the ramifications of having a herniated disc? Are there any? 
after surgery for six weeks, I tell my patients the only restriction is no lifting more than 10 or 15 pounds. Because what I don't want, that disc is a little fragile because you've already had a herniation and we've gone in and cleaned it up. I just don't want it to be squeezed too much. You can still walk as much as you want, be on a, a bicycle or, or in the swimming pool, but just no lifting more than 10 or 15 pounds. And after six weeks, you can go back to anything you want to do. What is your, your, your feeling about people uh, driving, sitting for any length of time. So if, if I'm a patient who uh, uh, has, has just had a discectomy and I'm thinking of taking a 12-hour road trip or I'm thinking of taking an airplane trip, I know in, we used to really dissuade people from that. Right. Is that still something you would tell people not to do? Well, sitting is really hard on the low back. Sitting requires a lot of the muscles to be working and it's probably, and we know from our studies that it puts a lot of pressure on the discs. Mm -hmm. So it's not something ideal, but we do know people have to drive and they have to fly and you have to get home and that sort of thing. So what I tell people is if you have to drive or fly, every hour or two just plan on getting up and walking around, let those muscles relax, make sure you're comfortable. Um, and so if it's gonna be a four hour drive, make it a five hour drive and every hour take a 15 minute break. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a five hour flight across the country, every half an hour you get up and you walk around to let your back relax. Okay, back to the other question. I've had a herniated disc. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to me? Long term wise, it probably doesn't mean too much uh, bad news for you at all. Um, as long as your nerves have recovered, we've gone and we've done the surgery, we've caught it in time, no weakness, no numbness, probably you go back and you can do anything you want to for the rest of your life. We do know that if you've had a herniated disc, you may have some genetic predispos predisposition to disc problem. And so it's just something we have to keep in mind. And the things I tell my patients are, you gotta make sure you stay in good shape, you keep doing exercises that keep your back nice and strong, try to avoid smoking if possible because that can increase the rate of disc degeneration. And if problems come back, we, we just keep a little closer eye on you. But I don't have to worry that all of a sudden I've got a bad back and I should not do certain things or not be athletic or not ski or anything like that? Fortunately, no. You know, the whole goal of the surgery is to get you back doing all those things. And after six weeks, I tell people, go back, leave your normal life, and that's the number one thing that we want. And, and along that same lines, complications. I mean, we all know that all surgery doesn't go well. What's the risk of complications for, for a, a disc excision or a discectomy? And what kind of complications am I looking at? Fortunately, the complications are extremely small. Um, bleeding, you lose a couple drops of blood and that's it. Uh, really the only true complication p risk is that there could be injury to the nerves um, or the sac that covers the nerves during the surgery and that risk is very low, um, the uh, probably less than 1%. Um, I've never had in any procedure I've done, knock on wood, but it, the risk is there. Um, so you really want to go to a surgeon with lots of experience doing this. Um, the other risk is that if uh, some patients get up after surgery and go, gosh, my, my leg pain's all gone, I want to, you know, I'm going to go to the gym and lift 100 pounds of weight. Well, you don't want to do that because you don't want to pound on that disc too much. And some patients, unfortunately, within a few weeks after surgery, have a new herniation that comes out there, especially if we do activities that um, aren't appropriate for the first month or six weeks after surgery. If that happens, sometimes we have to go in and take out that little herniation. But usually, just by being a little cautious in those first six weeks, we can avoid that, and really the complications are extremely low. Now you mentioned the complication that, that you mentioned the leakage of the spinal fluid out of the spinal sac. Uh, does that require a second operation, or is that something that will heal itself? How do you treat that? Usually if there's a leakage of the spinal fluid, we fix it at the time of the first surgery. Occasionally, if for some reason the surgeon doesn't notice it at the time of the first surgery, um, a few days of bed rest will help that heal on its own. Because these incisions are so small, it'll tend to tamponade or kind of block itself off. Usually after two or three days of bed rest, it'll stop and get better. In very, very rare cases, would it require going back in and, and actually sewing it back up, but that, especially for this kind of very small procedure. Well, and, and you know, the, the, obviously any time uh, we're operating around the spine, patients are always concerned about, could I be paralyzed? Mm -hmm. um, Whereas that's a, a more real complication, possible complication uh, up in the neck and the upper back, the lumbar spine, that, that, that's less of a worry. 
So define for me the difference between a nerve injury and really being paralyzed. Sure. So uh, that's, a, that's a question I get asked all the time. And the great part about the low back or lumbar spine is that the risk of true paralysis is essentially zero. And that's because the spinal cord, which is the firm tubulike structure that carries all of the big nerves, comes down from the brain through the neck or cervical spine into the chest area or thoracic spine, but stops usually at the very top of the lumbar spine at lumbar one. Below that, we have what's called the cauda equina, which is just the nerve roots coming down. Now, the nerve roots are very different than the spinal cord. The spinal cord is very sensitive. Even a little pressure like that on the spinal cord can cause permanent paralysis. But the nerve roots are very uh, resilient, and so pressure on them for prolonged periods uh, can have no long-term sequelae. So that's why surgery on the low back is definitely very safe and has essentially a zero risk of paralysis because even in a worst case scenario, let's say I took one of those nerves and cut it in an experiment, all we would see would be a very small amount of weakness in one particular area. Maybe the big toe would be weak, but not the whole leg or anything like that. Yeah, I think that I think that's a very clear explanation for that. E any other concepts or any other um, ideas you'd like to share with patients who are maybe faced with, with looking at surgery for a herniated disc or trying to determine uh, what to do about the herniated disc? Well, you know, the herniated discs are a very common problem. They're the number one thing that, uh, number one reason that people have spine surgery in the U.S. But fortunately, the surgery is very reliable, very safe, and results in rapid pain relief. So for the patients who don't get better with conservative treatments or who just can't wait to get better, it's a great option. Now, by no means do I tell patients to run out and get surgery. What we want to do is try to treat them to get them better with the best modalities possible for them, whether that's physical therapy, medicines, or surgery. Um, but this is a problem that's very fixable uh, and leads to really no long-term problems. I'm going to put you on the spot. Good. If you had a herniated disc, knowing what you know, when would you opt for surgery? It would depend on how much it, it affected my life. If it was my pain was bad enough where I couldn't leave the house and, or I could kind of uh, limp around, I would probably have surgery almost immediately. If my pain, if it was a little numbness and just occasional numbness and tingling, I would deal with it, do physical therapy, do medicines, get the injections, and then go with it. So really, I think it's based on how much it affects someone's life. You know, for the same amount of pain in someone who has a desk job and can sit at the desk and kind of their pain be relieved is very different than someone who's, say, a carpenter, a manual laborer, who's got to be moving things all day, and they can't have that pain because they just can't work. And so we've got to take into account the symptoms and how much it affects that particular patient's life. Okay. Well, thanks. Good information. It's my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.